is Joshua Dildine and I am a painter and photographer. The painting and photography are coming together. They're kind of colliding and then kind of dancing in this in-between space where I am treating the photography like abstract painting and then I'm treating like the abstract painting part like photography. So I'm adding highlights into the paint where I am messing with gravity with the photography. You know, photography really deals with that kind of depth of field, things that are in focus and out of focus. And so to play that up in the abstract painting is, is just kind of dancing the two ideas together and trying to find this like happy middle ground. So in this body of work, for the most part, I've started manipulating pattern from the, the photograph and kind of taking things that have this small visual presence and making it more substantial and then reacting to that with the paint and then just kind of having that, continuing that relationship between abstraction and sometimes in abstract painting there's pattern repetition and so messing with the photograph, it seems like this logical jump to start to mess with it. and. Uh, and cover up and hide, but also reveal um, certain things in, in that matter. The show is different from the last show. Um, Scale-wise, I started to make the pieces a little bit more on an intimate size. Last show, the pieces were much larger, um, almost life-size, like the characters in the photos were more life-size, and this, this is, closer uh, on a smaller scale, forced me to be more um, engaged with that connection between the two ideas of abstraction and, and photography and manipulating the patterns became this logical thing that happened when I'm spending so much time on a canvas that's this big rather than really large. I almost feel like the time that it took to paint these were longer, uh, more labor intensive. Also, I think the, the photographs are merging two, two families, almost two families together. Like I have my wife and, and her family and the, just kind of the cultures are combining as like my life from past and present is just kind of jumbling together. So that, that's, that's also been more present in, in the newer work. One thing that I'm really interested in is the ownership that's now happening in the paintings because there's this thing that's happening underneath that I'm obscuring but there's parts of it that are coming out like you know you have like drapes or you have like the carpet or you have a chair that people can kind of associate with but the identity is revealed so it kind of makes it more broad but the people the subjects that are behind them still have that sense of ownership that connection so they place themselves a part of these scenes, even though that's not the primary thing, that's a secondary thing that's happening of late that I'm really interested in. It started off as a joke, it started off as me painting over my parents' engagement photo as kind of a, me joshing around and as it became like more serious and the blending these two ideas together, the side thing was happening, this relationship between the subject and the actual image. The image is incredibly powerful. You know, when you're defacing somebody, how do you do that in a positive way is, becomes more challenging. So one interesting story is, you know, I have two kids. One of the kids is a three-year-old that loves to run around and paint with me, and I love that too. I went in for a break, and then the door was left open, he came out, and I had this wonderful layer that I was ready just to call it a day, it was done. He got into my supplies and took a pen and scribbled out the whole painting. That was pretty devastating. But it was interesting because I'm realizing that my son doesn't like it when I paint over him. Like when he sees the action of me painting over him, he does not like it. And part of this was this reaction of like getting mad at me, but also like wanting to take ownership of his own image. And, uh, and I ultimately worked back into it and I was able to kind of bring it to this beautiful conclusion, but it also taught me that I should paint while he's napping rather than having him around the studio. So um, if I'm painting over him.
my name is Tim Babington and I make paintings and um, some public works and sculptures too. The last show was the sequence of Heart Above Head paint. They went from a stripe painting to a distortion paint in various degrees. This show um, shows clean stripe paintings I've been doing for a lot of years. We have a distortion piece similar to where the heart above head ended, um, that sequence, and then introduced three new paintings, which they're beyond studies, but they're initial paintings in, in something that might be a longer exploration, but again, another element of um, an analogous to an effect that one might put on music or how one, and it's just another compositional uh, device and way for me to actually change things up a bit. Another thing that I had done, and we've got two of them here, are, and they're older, they were older paintings. Whereas the stripe paintings were based on music compositions, was I made these fuzzy paintings based on single and album covers from my youth. One of them, the one that, um, Get Happy, the painting is based on. It's based on the album cover of uh, Elvis Costello's Get Happy album, on which uh, the graphic designer I was a fan of, um, um, still am, uh, Barney Bubbles, had printed intentionally worn image of the circle having burnished away the print on the cover. So he would do these things that would just flat out wrong, but they were irreverent and um, I love that. So that was um, a movie done there and I'd done a, a, a thing based on it. So I did those album cover pictures some years ago. I still had them around. And in that similar vein, I thought, as I've had paintings repaired, and then it makes me think about how precious we think about paintings and we put these in the gallery. They look pristine. I don't know what we're doing as painters. We try it where our finish is so tight and clean and product-like and um, fresh and new if it catches people's attention. And then we worry about maintaining that appearance and that uh, pristine quality ever after. That's the value of it. I, I feel about the same way as one would about these album covers, about these records. They're things that they're objects of uh, affection that we collect and treasure. And then another way for me to do something, another move similar to um, the cleaner distortion paintings in the vein of Barney Bubbles, I thought, well, I've got a couple of paintings that damage. Why don't we just put more damage on there? It actually, again, gives me another way to make a gesture. Well, that doesn't look like it. It looks like it's been in and out of the racks a lot. And, you know, years down the road, these things will have a life and things will happen to them and you cannot expect them to not get damaged. People do and they hope that they don't. And they occasionally call up the gallery, they call up the studio, how do you repair one of your paintings? I mean, you know, I mean, it's every now and then I'll do something and the practical, there's a practical joke in there as well, which is we'll never have to worry about damage in this painting because you wouldn't be able to tell. The stripe ones, I think, are the ones that interest me the most. And I actually think taking those older paintings the, of all kinds, actually, I like what's done to them. Where I, on the album cover ones, had a chance to put in what appear to be like where they've rubbed on the corner braces of the paintings, um, even though those stretches don't have um, corner braces. I knew that if I'm going to refer through this burnish and the potential of having um, rubbed against the stretcher, it will reference the stretcher also, obviously, and um, it gives me this option with marks which are essentially damage marks, but they are, they're a compositional element for me and give me a place to put gesture and so on. So I think the Get Happy painting was really improved by the appearance of burnish marks from the corner braces. I mean, actually, compositionally, I think it, it's, I think it's about painting. There are difficulties in making um, something compositional dynamic in the way many paintings do that a stripe painting cannot do because it has just it simply has vertical lines and there's no other direction in it. So I figured out a way in this case to put a different direction in.
it's all an experiment, right? These are in a sort of initial proposal, and the good thing that I get out of them is that I see them and see more possibilities for more work, and I think, okay, now I want to go back to the studio because I, um, I can do something with this. And then it was Jonah who, who put those two small studies side by side, and um, I think that's perfect. That's, um, again, another uh, compositional possibility. It gives me more to think about when I go back to the studio. You know, a, another thing about doing a little damage to something you've been doing for a long time, it just, I need to do something to lighten up, you know, the pressure that builds when you create a body of work and you've been doing it for 15, 16 years and it becomes uh, a thing that it, I just don't think you, you want to get too overprotective about. The possibilities have to stay open. So this is a, when I could just do something that took the edge off the preciousness of these things and then um, people t tend to be put off you know by the um, imposing uh, perfectly um, preserved presentations of abstract paintings in galleries so there's a few in this show which are just kind of like well we knock around in the real world too and we will be afterwards <laughs>